Hello, this is Shane Stevenson, and welcome to this unique way of giving a presentation uh, through the University Express program. Uh, today I'll be talking about a little about Buffalo's East Side industry. Uh, I have published, back in 2016, I published a book uh, called Buffalo's East Side Industry uh, from the Images of America and Arcadia Publishing. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the history of the East Side and um, highlighting some companies uh, that used to be on the East Side of Buffalo. I look forward to giving this presentation. So why a book on industry? All right, well, there's been a lot of resurgence in uh, interest in the history of Buffalo, the waterfront, uh, the grain elevators, and so that I also worked at the Buffalo History Museum for five years uh, in their photographic collection, and I was coming across all these fascinating old photographs of the east side of Buffalo. And I said, well, there's a story here that has to be told. So ultimately, Buffalo was founded, like many other cities, uh, on, based on the potential use of natural resources. And uh, with Buffalo, we had plenty of natural resources. Uh, our first companies that uh, established themselves in the village of Buffalo were based on moving manufacturing goods, right, and ultimately people. All right, so we were uniquely positioned to help westward expansion of America uh, by Easterners. All right, if you're familiar with the Porter family, all right, there are two brothers. Augustus settled in Niagara Falls, and Peter Porter settled in Black Rock, Buffalo area. And what they did was they bought up shoreline from the village of Buffalo and Black Rock up through Niagara Falls, and they charged people uh, to take goods and products to the shore of Lake Erie uh, to be added to boats. All right, so they really felt that... Uh, in addition to being accomplished in their professional lives, that Buffalo really had this unique place to help transport goods and people to the to the West, all right, and through the Great Lake areas, all right. Some of our natural resources certainly were the Buffalo Harbor, uh, the Niagara River, the Erie Canal, uh, the railroad system, harnessing the power of Niagara Falls. So it. Buffalo really became uniquely positioned. Eventually, we had 16 distinct rail lines coming into the city of Buffalo, which was the second most behind Chicago. Some of the more uh, well-known uh, transportation and material moving uh, entities are on this slide. In the upper left, that is the Niagara Frontier Food Terminal, or what's known as the Clinton Bailey Market. All right, that was uniquely positioned along with the food market in Cleveland, uh, and they harnessed the power of those rail lines that I had just mentioned in delivering food to a growing population. Uh, in the upper right is the East Buffalo Stockyards. All right, so that was kind of the waylay station for livestock coming from the west and moving and being transported to the east. So all of these uh, livestock, it would be able to hold about 100,000 animals at any given time, were able to be offloaded here at East Buffalo and then picked up by rail lines heading east to Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. Uh, in the lower left is the Art Deco masterpiece, one of our two Art Deco masterpieces here, uh, the Central Terminal. And in the lower right, you have one of those distinct rail line companies, the Buffalo, New York, and Pennsylvania Rail Line. So here's a great map from 1906 of the downtown area, specifically the waterfront. All right, so if you take a look from the upper left to the middle of the map, that's the Erie Canal, all right? Extending outward from the middle of the map to uh, to the right and off of the map was the Maine and Hamburg Canal, right? And 
in between those, those there you'll see the two little slips, one of them being the commercial slip. And you'll also see coming off of the Maine and Hamburg Canal on the right of the map is the Clark and Skinner Canal and the Ohio Slip, which led to the Ohio Basin. All right, so Buffalo created this really intricate canal system to move products and people and goods. All right, uh, the Maine and Hamburg Canal led out to the hydraulic neighborhood, um, which is where which is where Larkinville is now. So I'll talk about that in a minute. To be clear, the east side of Buffalo was the heart of Buffalo's growth, population, and industrial base for about 170 years. All right, so when we looked at that map in the prior slide, we saw that there was a lot of congestion down uh, on the waterfront and in the downtown core. So if a company wanted to expand, they would have to find a new place to uh, set up shop, so to speak. All right, and that forced a lot of the companies to look to the east. All right now, at that time, the east side was a, a collection of uh, farmland, all right, streams, creeks, villages, and business owners and city founders decided that because of all that land, it was a great place to set up uh, an industrial base. In the 1820s, the hydraulic neighborhood developed which you'd call the hydraulic neighborhood in general terms, the Larkinville area today. All right, it, it developed in a small industrial base using the Little Buffalo Creek as, uh, as a power uh, through water. Uh, in the late 1820s to the 1830s, streets began being laid out. And by the time the village of Buffalo became the city, in 1832, Jefferson Avenue was the easternmost street of the new city. All right, it was about four, four and a half square miles. In the 1840s, rail lines began entering the city. All right, we already had the Buffalo and Niagara Falls Railroad Company and the Attica and Buffalo Railroad Company. All right, but the Buffalo and Albany Railroad Company was created in 1842. And so in addition to having the Erie Canal, we also now had a rail line connecting from the eastern seaboard of, through the Hudson River up to Albany, onto a train or the canal, and coming to Buffalo. By the 1850s now, with the city's growth, after the development and use of the Erie Canal in 1825, Streets are now being laid out to Bailey Avenue. All right, and what we what I found in doing research was in the 1860s, most of the industry that was on the east side were for daily living. All right, so they were addressing the boom in population that was settling, the streets being built, the houses being constructed. All right, so most of the industry on the east side was for daily living. Right, you can see there from the Buffalo City Directory that there were awning makers, blacksmiths, brewers, contractors, shingle manufacturers, right, timber companies. Right, so most of the industry which settled around what I'd like to call the timber belt, right, the streets like Walnut and Hickory and Spruce and Cedar, uh, were for daily living. From 1860 to 1890, the population expands from 81,000 to 310,000. All right, and now you have a nice conf conflux with and a nice merging between the industrial growth on the east side and the second industrial revolution, which allowed factories to be bigger, assembly line production, uh, larger and more product could be made uh, than individual by hand. Right, so now in the 1890s, most of the businesses are now stretching out to Bailey Avenue, and those are the larger industries, the forgeries, the foundries, ironwork companies, all right, lumber yards, railroad depots, you'll see that there. All right, so 
beginning growth is industries of daily living, still nestled within that Michigan to out to Jefferson Avenue. After the 1860s, their expand businesses are expanding out to Bailey and the industries are becoming larger because they can produce more product more quickly. All right, in the 1890s, Buffalo had about 76 dry goods stores and 51 of them were on the east side. So looking at, looking at the population now, all right, 51 out of 76 uh, dry goods stores is quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of businesses that are settled in one particular area of Buffalo. The 1880 census shows that there were 13 wards in Buffalo, which probably we would call them uh, our councilmatic districts, of which there are nine today. Population was roughly 170,000. And the wards that incorporated the east side, mostly Ward 3, 5, 6, and 7, totaled 78,000 people. While the wards for the rest of the city, of which there were nine, all right, that's South Buffalo, that's the west side, that's Black Rock, and then that's moving north uh, into the north country of what became North Buffalo uh, and areas north of the west side, uh, that population is 92,000. So you'll see in about four out of the 13 wards holds half, almost half of the population of Buffalo. So it shows that people settled where the jobs were. All right, so I will let you know there will be a test at the end of the presentation regarding some of these major locally grown companies. So these were companies that settled on the east side that were founded by people from Buffalo or had moved to Buffalo. All right, like the Spencer Kellogg and Sons Company, the Buffalo Foundry, Kaufman's Bakery, uh, Buffalo Forge, Buffalo Pottery. Okay, so these were companies that were founded by people who had already lived in Buffalo. On a national or regional scale, there were many companies that also decided to move into the east side because of those natural resources, access to rail lines, and access to the water. So companies like General Motors, Otis Elevator, Nabisco, all right, or the National Biscuit Company, all right, U.S. Rubber Reclaiming Company, Lisk Savoy, all right, so you can see other companies, because of our natural resources and our workforce, chose to build plants in Buffalo on the east side. So now what I'll do is I'll run through a couple of local uh, of companies that were established on the east side, talk a little bit about their history and what they made. One of my favorites is the Buffalo Forge Company. Uh, I had wanted this picture to be on the cover of the book. Uh, but they decided because there weren't many people in it that it wouldn't be the best photograph. But this was one of the images that I want. Eventually, the Eberl Ironwork Company was chosen, and thankfully they're still in business today. So that was a, a nice connection there, and it actually was the best photograph to use because it does show close-ups of people. So this is actually on Mortimer Street at Broadway, all right, so the photographer is standing on Mortimer, looking north across Broadway, and you can see how big the Buffalo Forge Company actually was. All right, for me, I tried to go uh, in 2015. I went and tried to stand in the place that that cameraman did in 1929, and I took a similar picture, and here's what I saw in 2015. So thankfully... They are, there is a large construction project going on there now, and I think it's called the Buffalo Forgery, uh, where it's going to be mixed use, industrial, manufacturing, some light, light manufacturing that is, and residences. So if you were to go by 490 Broadway today, you'll actually see a building there, which is really fabulous for the neighborhood and for the continued growth of Buffalo.
So Buffalo Forge was founded by William Went, and he was later jo joined by his brother, uh, Henry Went. Right? Uh, the company originally was on Washington Street, but again, they wanted to expand. So in 1880, they moved to uh, 490 Broadway. And you'll see that they really went through some acquisitions, all right? They acquired the George L. Squire Manufacturing Company, which made sugar and ice machinery. Uh, they, they acquired the Buffalo Steam Pump Company, all right, which made pumps for chemicals and paper mills. All right, they opened the Canadian Blower and Forge Company in Montreal and Kitchener in Ontario, which opened up the British market. And so what they originally were doing was making uh, blowers and forges for blacksmiths. All right, before, you know, there's the big fire, there's the bellows. And what they did was they created a fan and a, and a stand that the blacksmith could work at, right, while, push, while stoking the fire with the fan and also pushing all of that pollution away from the actual blacksmith. All right, but by the, by the late turn of the century, the late 1890s and into 19 through 1910, the first decade of the 20th century, blacksmithing was uh, decreasing as an occupation. All right, there are other modes of transportation. Again, with the second industrial revolution, iron products and metal products were being made more quickly and more efficiently. All right, so they began expanding out and almost exclusively going to uh, fan creation, ventilation, blowing, blowing machines, and air control. All right. With the changeover the, uh, it, of moving from uh, building forges for blacksmiths into air ventilation and air moving, uh, in conjunction with that, the Auditorium Hotel in Chicago contacted the Buffalo Forge Company and asked them, you know, we'd like to get air movement through the building better, uh, hot air and cold air, and how can we do that? All right, so in the late 1890s, they began looking into humidifying and dehumidifying air in factories. All right, and they also were at the ground level of companies all over the country, all right, that were building buildings. Right, and how they helped with the designing and cooling of heating and cooling systems for those different building constructions. All right, so they were at the blueprint level for companies all over the country. All right, they're most known for uh, being the, the founders of the air conditioning movement, all right, and the founder of the air conditioner. So Willis Carrier was an employee at Buffalo Forge, and he was in charge of the team that would develop the air conditioning unit and how to get it through large buildings like the Auditorium Hotel in Chicago and other buildings throughout the country. All right, so they seeded the company, they incubated the company, and then after a few years, Carrier, they had a deal in place where Carrier would move out of Buffalo and he moved to Syracuse and opened up the Carrier Engineering Corporation. All right, in 1993, the company was bought by the James Howden and Company, all right, which was a longtime competitor, and about that time, almost a hundred years of competitor, as a competitor, all right. So they closed the Buffalo Forge Company in roughly '95 through '97, all right. But they still have an office open today in Depew, which has about a hundred workers. And what that is, which would make sense, is they refurbish old parts. All right, so there's a lot of forges and a lot of ventilation units that are older. And so they have the expertise in Depew to go into a company and say, oh, we've got this Buffalo Forge product from the 1940s. We don't know what to do with it or how to repair it. These individuals who work at this office do. All right, so it's, it's a nice segue. Um, and of course, the Went family, you know, the heir of William Went, Wendy, uh, Margaret L. Went, all right, she founded uh, the foundation, which still does many millions of dollars of good work throughout the city of Buffalo and Western New York. Okay, next up is the uh, 
Hewitt Rubber Company, founded by Herbert H. Hewitt. And he was actually a transplant from Chicago. Right? He worked for the Pullman Car Company, which was, they manufactured luxury train cars. All right, for an exclusive clientele, obviously. But So he moved to Buffalo in 1908 or 1909, and he founded the rubber company uh, here. And now I love this advertisement. It's actually not in the book, but uh, it says, you know, Hewitt Rubber Products Bound for Iran. So obviously that's well before 1979 and the Iranian Revolution. So you can see with that red dot, that's where the company was. And you can obviously see the layout and the footprint of the company. The building is now gone. All right, but to give you an idea, that's St. Mary's School for the Deaf is in the upper left. That's Main Street cutting across uh, from left to up to center. And then that lower massive, that massive buildings in the lower right is Sisters Hospital. And you can see, if you can see that, there's train tracks that cut across north to south, right, right next to where the Hewitt Rubber Company was. And that Buffalo Belt Line uh, was so instrumental to many industries on the east side, and I talk a lot more about the Buffalo Belt Line in, uh, in the book. All right, but the company was founded in 1909, all right, and they started making rubber products for the rail lines. But naturally, as with many, pro uh, many companies, in the 1910s, they started building uh, and creating rubber products for automobiles, right? So hoses was their primary uh, product, and they made them for uh, the heating units, the air braking units, uh, the left and right signaling, and water and steam lines. In 1974, the company closed, and the building was taken down. All right, so they were around uh, for about 65 years. Today, the H.H. Hewitt home has been opened as a bed and breakfast at 619 Lafayette Avenue by Joe and Ellen Latiri, and that's called In Buffalo, I-N-N, -N, In Buffalo, and it's a really, really nice uh, restoration that they did, and now people come from all over the country and they stay at that bed and breakfast. All right, next we'll see a, a really lovely letterhead from the Wildwood Company. All right, they were, as many of you may know, they're a hair product. All right, so this letter is from about 1920, I think, if that's what it says. <laughs> uh, uh, it's in the book, but it had to be black and white photographs, so you're really not getting that beautiful eye-popping uh, letterhead. All right, so it was founded in 1909, just like the Hewitt Rubber Company, uh, by Robert Kidney and Mor Morrill Howe. And they were actually barbers at the Iroquois Hotel in downtown Buffalo. All right, but they created tonic for hair. All right, and so what they did was they had to expand and they looked to the east side and they opened up at 1490 Jefferson which is that image on the left-hand side. Thankfully, the building is still there, and I believe it's a senior senior living facility now. Uh, but they're most well-known for, after 1945, they moved towards Bailey Avenue, and that's the image on the right. Uh, Bailey Avenue is cutting north and south, right on the right-hand side of the image, and their main plant was right next to that. But they also expanded and purchased a, manu uh, a hosiery manufacturing company right to the left of Fay Street. All right, so you'll see the two dots there. All right, uh, in 1954, they were purchased by the Palmolive Corporation, and they closed the Buffalo facility. All right, they had 12 products. By 1950, they spent about $3 million a year in advertising. And they had 80 salesmen on staff that went over the that went all over the country, and sell sold the products directly to supermarkets, stores, and barber shops. All right, the George Urban Milling Company. Right, many of us are familiar because of the street, George Urban Boulevard. All right, here's a nice picture from about 1912. 
uh, of them with their uh, carts and horses getting ready to deliver some flour. They're right on Care Street in Urban. All right, so that's right now where the milk bone, milk bone plant is, right, which used to be the old Nabisco plant. And right by, if you're quite familiar, the abandoned uh, Wonder Bread facility there with that lovely red sign on the, on the roof. All right, so they were founded a long time ago in 1846 by George Urban. All right, by the 1880s, they were the first milling plant in America to use electricity to turn their grinding and sifting machines. All right, and they used what was called the Hungarian system, all right, of making flour. All right, so that was they would use pressed rollers along a conveyor belt and grind out uh, the wheat, all right, and turn it into the flour. All right, by the 1930s, Buffalo was producing one-tenth of all the flour in America. All right, and there were so many milling companies in Buffalo that they were, every two days, they were producing enough flour to feed the whole city of Buffalo for one year. That's the amount of production that all of our milling plants were putting out uh, in the 1930s. All right. That goes along then, that connects us with the waterfront and all of the grain elevators, and that's why Buffalo became this huge flour milling city. All right. It also expanded the animal feed industry here in Buffalo because 30% of the wheat kernels were used for animal feed. All right, so they would, all of the mills would discard that 30% and give it and sell it to uh, animal uh, feed companies, which would then produce, use that material to produce animal food. All right, the International Steam Pump Company. You could take a look at that beautiful pump. All right now, what they did was they sold pumps for uh, for water supplies. All right. They worked closely with municipalities all over the country, and when they were setting up their water plants and water lines throughout their particular cities or towns or villages, uh, most notably there are Worthington, which is also the other name for International Steam Pump Company, uh, there are Worthington pumps at our Colonel Ward station at the foot of Porter here in Buffalo, and you can go tour them. All right, so it started in 1889 by the uh, called the Snow Steam Pump Company, right? And the, in 1899, about 10 years later, they merged with four other companies to become known as the International Steam Pump Company. And they each took a different name. So this is like the Buffalo Works Worthington Division, you know, and there, were, there was another company in Brooklyn and Massachusetts and... Cincinnati, Ohio. All right, in 1912, the first American diesel engine was produced at our plant here on Roberts Avenue. And if you take a look at that mass of buildings, you'll see the 190s there. So when you're driving away from the city on the 190 South, you can still see that collection of buildings. All right, that actually is a total of 72 separate buildings that they would merge, they merge together. And it had about 800 employees, eight, eight, 1,800 employees at the height of their production. All right. Of course, into the 80s, there were sell-offs. And one division still lives on in Dresser Rand, which has plants in Olean, Wellsville, and uh, Painted Post, New York. All right. So, uh the Worthington Pump Company or the International Steam Pump Company uh, still does live on through Dresser Rand. All right, there were, as I mentioned, there were hundreds and hundreds of other companies uh, on the east side. What we are looking at here are maps. In the upper left, you'll see it's a parking lot, but that was where the Irvin Air Chute Company was located. 
that was the first company to mass produce parachutes in America. Uh, the top image on the right is what is currently the post office on William Street, but that's where the East Buffalo Stockyards used to be. All right, and down below that is the Eberl Ironworks Company, which I mentioned is now uh, the company that's on the cover of the book, and they are still in business on Sycamore and Michigan Avenues. All right. Maybe some of you are familiar with Michael Beecher and the Globe Woven Belt Company. Their mass, massive uh, plant is there in the upper right. I'm sorry, in the upper left. In the upper right is the Lisk Savoy, or as some people have corrected me, Lisk Savory Company. They were a leader in enamel and uh, copper and tin housing wares. All right, in the lower left was the Cooper Paper Box Company. All right, which held many patents for folding cartons and designing of cartons uh, for storage and transportation. And in the lower right is the F.N. Burt Company, all right, which at its height was producing about 90% of the cigarette boxes in America. All right, thankfully, that building has been repurposed, and it's now apartments, small businesses, and it's really come to life over the last, say, three or four years. All right, so as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, and I really hope that everyone has enjoyed this, uh, for about 170 years, Buffalo, uh, the east side of Buffalo, was the population center and the industrial center of Buffalo and Western New York. And I say, when you're the top dog, you have nowhere to go but down, and that's what happened. Again, you had a mingling and a merging of different technologies and different ways of doing uh, business. And so after World War II, you had the growth of suburbia, you had the growth of an automobile industry, now where almost every family had a car, and you had companies, national companies, coming in and buying up company, local companies and then closing them, or moving them down south or to the west. All right, so like Palmolive in 1954, they came in, they bought up Wild Root, and then summarily closed it. For those workers, they were now out of a job. Where else were they going to go? So many people packed up and left, all right, and they moved to the newer suburban areas like uh, Depew and Cheektowaga, all right, and so it just became a ball rolling downhill. Companies would be bought, or they would close, and people would move. And so now, after 170 years of being the top dog, it is what you see today that is a struggling neighborhood. African Americans and racial tensions cannot be left out of it. All right, in the 1950s, a lot of African Americans moved, uh, rightly so, fleeing the Jim Crow laws of the South. But white people and the people that had settled there prior viewed African Americans as co competition, all right? Competition for uh, a, a, a slowly shrinking industrial base, right? And there were a couple of famous riots, right? In 1967 and 1968, all right? One was over the assassination of Martin Luther King, and in 1967, it was over the lack of housing. All right, so that just created a large tension. Um, one side's not right, one side's not wrong, but it created a tension where there was a lot of white flight and white people left and moved out to the suburbs. The beauty of the East Side is that it was the birthplace of all of our immigrant populations starting in 18, the 1820s. All right, it was the first, it was the first settlement for the free blacks uh, that settled here or moved from the South a long time ago. It was the settlement of, of our Jewish populations. It was the settlement of our Germans and, of course, our Polish populations. So there is a resurgence on Buffalo's east side now, 
because what we're seeing is new immigrants moving in, restoring home. <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, restoring homes and opening their own small businesses. So 170 years, East Side was the top dog for population in the industrial base. And now for the past, say, 60 years or so, it, is, it has been knocked down. But I, through my understanding and through uh, my belief that the East Side is beginning to turn the corner and to come back. All right, well, that's it for the presentation. Uh, I hope you really enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, I know this isn't usually I'd be standing in front of people, but you can f feel free to reach out to me. Uh, email is the best way. I am at arc in the buff. That's all one word. Arc, A-R-C-H, in the buff at yahoo.com. All right, in addition to writing a book about Buffalo's east side industry, I also wrote one specifically in 2018 about the Larkin Company. That was settled in the hydraulic area, and that's a fascinating look at a fascinating company uh, as well. All right, so there's about 141 companies I highlight in Buffalo's east side industry, and there's one in the Larkin Company. But again, please feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to speak to you more. I hope everyone's staying safe and staying healthy. Thank you very much.